Whenever you're dropped into a massive fantasy world, there are bound to be questions. And when it comes to games as big as Dragon's Dogma 2, that list of questions can get a bit overwhelming. Never fear Arisen, because we are here to help you conquer the world and claim dominion over the land. My name is Kodiak, this is Legacy Gaming, and today we're sharing our ultimate beginner's guide for Dragon's Dogma 2. So first things first, as with any good fantasy RPG, you'll need to create a custom character. You can get lost in the myriad of settings and options, but unlike most RPGs, the developers over at Capcom don't subscribe to traditional thinking. You might argue they are the only developers that are actually realistic about some aspects of character creation. If you make a character tall and fat, they'll have a bigger hitbox, more base stamina, be able to carry more, and have a relatively easier time grappling opponents. On the flip side, if you're small and skinny, you'll have a small hitbox, faster stamina recovery, faster climbing speeds on things, and an easier time moving around enemies during combat. This is not actively tracked during character creation, but it's something you need to factor in before stepping into the world, because it's going to set a baseline for your entire experience. Once you create a character, you're thrust into the world and made to fend for yourself. And let me tell you, things get pretty tough pretty quick. If there's one thing I've learned during my time with the game, it's how to best approach every exploration into the world. Our buddy Cinderash, who streams on Twitch, actually said something that really stuck with me. He said that every time you leave a city or hub in Dragon's Dogma 2, you should approach it as if you're going on a hike. You want to carry all of the essentials without overloading yourself with a bunch of stuff you don't actually need. After dozens of hours with the game, I can tell you this is the only way you should approach Dragon's Dogma 2. You walk almost everywhere in the game, and while there are ways around that, the act of traversing the world is what you'll do 90% of the time. Before ever setting foot outside of a town, you'll want to offload all of your non-essential items into your storage, which you can access from the innkeeper. There is almost no reason why you'd carry a bunch of skins and ore out into the world, because you'll never actually use it out there. You'll also want to spend the time to combine any and all food that might go bad during the trip. Creating things like dried fruit not only extends the life of the food indefinitely, but helps reduce your overall load and provides you with powerful curatives that you can use during combat. The goal here is to shed any extra weight and go into the next leg of your adventure with as many supporting items as possible. Before leaving whatever hub you're in, you'll also want to make sure you have the best armor and weapons available. Buying gear is a very common practice in the game, and there's actually value to the shopkeepers, which is why you should always at least check in with new vendors that you meet. Armor and weapon vendors can also enhance your gear, and using gold as well as resources you scavenge from your adventures, you can increase the stats of your gear. Before running off though, you'll want to scale up at the Vocation Guild Hall, an essential part of your character's progression that we'll discuss in another part of this video. With your bags lightened and your gear enhanced, it's time to head out into the world, and like I said, you will run practically everywhere in this game. Dragon's Dogma 2 is unlike any other RPG on the market in that there is no consistent fast travel system. That's why being prepared matters, because moving from point A to point B often involves 20, 30, or even 40 minutes of work and potentially dozens of combat encounters. You can travel by ox cart, which are found at major city hubs, as well as traveling between two major points of interest. For a little coin, you can hop in and doze off, but this isn't a foolproof method of getting around. During your nap, it's very possible that the ox cart is attacked and you're forced to fight whatever monstrosity is besieging your cart. This often means you don't arrive at your final destination and more realistically lands you somewhere in the middle. Or even worse, the monstrosity destroys your cart and you have to walk the rest of the way and paid for little to no travel. The game also features port crystals at certain fixed points around the world. Activating them allows you to teleport back to them at any time by using a fairy stone. This is super convenient, but also incredibly expensive as vendor stock of fairy stones are limited and they also cost 10,000 gold. Your access to these gets better as the game goes on and the system expands slightly, but early on it's important to recognize the value of port crystals and fairy stones. Now that you know the different methods of getting around the world, I think it's worth talking about how best to travel because there are some really key things you need to know as a new player. First is that your safest option, as is the case with most RPGs, is to travel on the main road. You will still encounter plenty of enemies, including some of the Monster Hunter style elites the Dragon's Dogma games are known for, but at the end of the day, it is safer. If things get out of control, you can always run. Enemies are leashed, which means eventually they will drop aggro and return to their original position. There's no doubt your pride will be hurt, but at the end of the day, dying is usually a worse option. 
When you venture off the road, there really is no telling what you'll find. In this regard, the game is very much like Skyrim, where you can find all sorts of caves, points of interest, and secret parts of the world hidden just out of sight. That curiosity also comes with its own risks, and you can fully expect to find loads more enemies off the beaten trail. While exploring, you'll want to keep your eyes peeled for treasure chests, which is one of the main ways you'll receive loot in the game. Wood chests reward you with standard loot, black metal chests reward you with rare loot, and ornate chests reward you with the highest tier loot. A good rule of thumb is to check every build or point of interest because chances are there is at least one chest hidden somewhere in the area. This is why it's so important to keep your weight down before adventuring because you'll pick up tons of items at a rapid pace. Things take quite a turn if and when you travel at night, and when I say Dragon's Dogma 2 is dark, I mean it. Traveling in the pitch black is not only terrifying, it's also incredibly dangerous. You can activate your lamp by holding down left bumper and then pushing right on your D-pad. This will activate lamps for your entire team, which does help, but it doesn't change the fact that different enemies will potentially attack you at night. If things get really gnarly, there is a way to quickly heal yourself. By holding down the left bumper and tapping up on the D-pad, you'll actually use whatever curative the game auto-selects for this category. As far as I can tell, there's no way to manually assign which curative you use, but the usage is instantaneous and you're not bogged down by any drinking animations or anything like that. Simply heal until you're topped off and you're good to get back into the fight. While you're exploring, you'll also want to keep an eye out for campfires. You can spot them from a distance thanks to the nice billowing plume of gray smoke floating above. As long as you or your main pawn has a camping kit, which you get early on in the game, you can set up camp as many times as you want. Not only does this fully restore your team's health and allow you to quickly jump to a specific time of day, either morning or night, it also allows you to cook one food item per camp, giving you and your team powerful buffs. Food is perishable and will rot away, so take the opportunity to cook whatever possible. Just be careful not to overwrite a more powerful buff with a lesser buff. For example, if cooking one item gives you plus four stats and is still active on your team, you don't want to cook a plus one food buff immediately at the next campsite because it'll most likely overwrite that plus four buff. Just keep an eye on the bottom of your screen and you should be fine. When you're first starting out, my guess is you'll think long and hard about your class, or vocation as they're called in the game. That's fair, but ultimately, you can choose and pivot between any vocation with relative ease. Yes, your early decision will lock you in for about an hour, but once you reach the first major city, you can stop at the vocation guild hall and unlock the additional base vocations. We won't get into any of the advanced vocations which are tied to other quests in this video, but I wanted to make it clear that you're not locked into your decisions. By killing enemies and completing quests, you'll earn XP as well as DCP or Discipline. As you gain XP, you'll level up not only your character, but your vocation as well. Leveling up increases your base stats, making you generally more powerful and durable, whereas leveling your vocation gives you access to more weapon skills, core skills, and augments at the vocation guild hall. Core skills inform your vocation's baseline function. They often include a basic attack, possibly a utility move, as well as various other quality of life features that make playing the vocation unique. For example, as a sorcerer, I can unlock Quick Cast, which allows me to use stamina to speed up my cast, which becomes so important as you fight more challenging enemies. On the other hand, weapon skills are powerful abilities and the majority of what forms your player's combat identity. These are your big damage dealers, defensive maneuvers, and team buffs, and while powerful, you can only have four equipped at one time. Using your discipline, you can unlock more and then swap them around at your vocation guild hall at any time. Augments are unlocked as you level up your vocation, and they're shared across your character regardless of the vocation, which is why leveling up multiple vocations is beneficial. These augments provide powerful passive stat boosts, so they shouldn't be ignored. Ultimately, it's important to experiment with vocations as they each play differently. They all have nuances about their kits, and until you go hands-on yourself, it's hard to know what they bring to the table. This is also important because, as we'll talk about, your pawn utilizes those same vocations, and having an understanding of how they work allows you to better synergize with your team. So, let's take a minute and walk through each starting vocation at the highest level. Fighters use a sword and shield. They have a strong emphasis on defending, which uses stamina when blocking an attack. Stamina also regens slower when blocking. Fighters can parry by blocking at the same time as an attack comes in, just like any Souls game. Fighters can also use follow-up attacks, which can be used after a target is knocked down or off balance or when a target is not expecting the attack. This is a powerful ability, but also leaves you open for attack. The fighter's weapon skills revolve around powerful sweeping blows as well as a number of utility and aggro abilities that aim at protecting yourself and the team. 
The archer uses the bow. This is a skill shot class that requires manual targeting to perform at its peak, but you can use auto aim to hit center mass on any and all targets. This is great for taking down flying enemies, but ignores the archer's most important element of combat, weak spots. By using steady shot, the archer can manually fire an arrow, which allows the player to control where they shoot, be it the eyes, tails, limbs, etc. The goal here is to do the maximum amount of damage, and the archer's kit is entirely built around damage with a few small utility weapon skills scattered in for survivability. The thief wields a pair of daggers and can swift step with the right bumper to allow the player to evade attacks and move around targets. They also have a follow-up attack called Twin Fangs, which lets you pin down foes that have been knocked off balance. When used, you can hold the Y button to continue the attack, which opens up the enemy for more attacks and massive damage, but also leaves you exposed. You also can't move while pinning an enemy. You can also climb onto larger foes, and there are a few weapon skills, including Twin Fangs, which can be used to deal large amounts of damage to enemies. The Thief also has the ability to follow up attack just like a warrior. Finally, there's the Mage, which wields a staff. They use elemental attacks to deal damage to enemies, but can also employ buffs to protect and enhance allies. Baseline, they have access to the curative magic spell Anodyne, allowing the mage to create a small healing sphere around them that other players can step into to recover health. It's worth pointing out that you can temporarily lose max HP by taking sustained damage. This reduces the ceiling of how much you can be healed, but can be restored by resting at a camp or inn. Mages also use encanting to cast spells. There's no mana, but each spell requires stamina and you must complete the incantation before you actually cast the spell. You can still move while encanting, but standing still will result in a faster spell cast. Moving slows the incantation down, and being attacked outright stops the spell. If you cast the same spell as a nearby NPC, a system called Auxiliary Encanting kicks in, and you blend your powers together to cast even faster. Early in the game, you'll be introduced to the pawn system. You'll have the opportunity to create a main pawn, which is an extension of yourself. Their vocation should be a complement to your own, because they'll be with you the entire game. For example, if you're a mage, consider making them a fighter to protect you. Just like you, your pawn's vocation can be changed at any time at a vocation guild hall, and they'll level up independently alongside you. You should treat them as you would yourself, unlocking all their core skills, assigning the best weapon skills, and making sure they're outfitted in the best gear. They are your most valuable ally in the game and can be the difference maker when fighting some of the elite enemies and bosses throughout the world. You can also utilize them as a pack mule to carry any additional items that you have that might otherwise push you over your weight limit. Just remember to unpack anything they're carrying when you get to an inn so they don't end up overburdened themselves. On top of your main pawn, you'll also be able to recruit two additional pawns from Rift Stones found throughout the world. When activating a Rift Stone, you'll receive a little Rift currency, but you'll also be able to step into the Rift and view other pawns that are available for hire. Pawns that are the same level as you can be recruited for free, whereas pawns above your level can be recruited but at a cost. The cool thing about these pawns is that they're actually the main pawns of other players, and when recruiting them, you'll see who their master is and all the details you could possibly need to know before bringing them temporarily onto your team. Fun fact, pawns of people on your friends list can be recruited for free regardless of level, so it can be advantageous to use them for a real life day, dismiss them, and then bring them back as your friend may have leveled and geared them up during that time. The thing is, these pawns are not meant to be with you forever. They don't level up alongside your team, and you have no control over their vocation and skills. You could equip them with gear, but it really isn't worth it because you'll lose it when you send that pawn back or they die. The key here is to check into a Rift Stone every couple of levels and make sure you have the strongest pawns available that fit into your team dynamic. I personally like to vary my pawns with diverse vocations, but you may opt for a melee heavy team or even multiple casters. The choice is really up to you. Keep in mind that your main pawn is also out there in the world for other players to use, which is why leveling them up and keeping them in the best gear possible is important. The more other players use your pawn, the more RCP you'll gain, which can be used, as I said earlier, to recruit these secondary pawns. With your team assembled, you also have the ability to quickly command them using the D-pad. The important ones are Go and Help. Go makes your pawns aggressive in combat, and out of combat, it means show me the way to things. If they have the trait, pawns can act as guides, and with the Go command, you can ask them to lead you to your chosen destination on the map. In addition, if they have knowledge of how to get to a cave, chest, or other point of interest, the go button will make them open said chest or show you the point of interest or lead the way. The help command puts an emphasis on healing during combat, 
and out of combat means you want your pawns to call out nearby resources and sometimes help loot and scavenge on your behalf. All of the commands should be used as necessary to help dictate the ebb and flow of combat. There are times where you'll want to be aggressive and other times you'll want the team to stay close. So don't forget about this small yet powerful system. So there you have it, our ultimate beginner's guide for Dragon's Dogma 2. We hope you found this video helpful, and if you did, do us a solid hit that thumbs up and consider subscribing. My name is Kodiak, and from everyone here at Legacy Gaming, thanks for watching, and play on.